Mac OS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they put a start button there. <laughs> yeah. Finally, it looks okay. good. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> all, all that it took. Just that stop button. You can't beat him, copy him. Right. Oh, you ready to be this in the back? Right. It's actually a really good window. Create really? some space here. Is there anything here that needs to be preserved? Oh, no. Uh, no, no. Nothing, nothing of any vital importance in it because it's going to be indiscriminate as well. I'm going to have to switch back and forth. I don't mind. Oh, you only have one camera? <laughs> the moment. Well, yeah. For the time. I don't know how much space we will need. But, uh, when you add it. People watching can refer to the PDF linked in the video description. Right. <laughs> so I'll mostly be talking about this slightly older paper because it introduces sort of most of these concepts in a nice way, even though a lot of more biomechanical details obviously known these days and people have been investigating this. This introduces a lot of the concepts that go under the global name of short-term synaptic plasticity. Uh, so maybe that is sort of like the the, the section of this, I'm going to build a bit of a hierarchical tree here of different mechanisms to give people an overview. So I guess um, called um, synaptic plasticity. Sometimes um, the Name uh, section of this. I'm going to draw the sorry, sorry, sorry. or <laughs> STSP. Sometimes people make that little difference there to differentiate short term plasticity that might be neural, where so short term changes in neurons, from short term changes in synapses. Um, but STP is the more common uh, term and it usually refers to synaptic processes. It's just sometimes there's also intrinsic excitability and things like that which are neural and not synaptic, so you might sometimes see STSP. Uh, so a lot of what I'm hoping to do today is just to give people a bit of an overview of different mechanisms that uh, go underneath that category of short-term synaptic plasticity. Ah, okay, right. Great, great. Um, so neuroplasticity are changes of the neuron, right? Uh, typically in response to uh, some electrochemical signaling. So these this can be activity, spike activity, but it could also be neuromodulators, you know, like dopamine changing neuron some, some way. Um, but we'll be talking mostly about synaptic things, and. With regards to the synapse, we will mostly be talking about the presynapse, meaning as a synaptic pair, we have to draw one here on the right. right. Uh, there's a pre and a post part, right, where you release transmitter down, and we're going to be talking about the presynapse. So not the part that is that is receiving the transmitter, but the part that is pushing transmitter. Um, good. Um, now to start. So um, I know Robert Zucker from like a bigger review on facilitation. He's been working on sort of these processes that work at the presynapse uh, quite a bit, um, um, and so I've returned to his papers to sort of find a paper that gives a decent overview of many of these topics. Um, and I picked this one because it's you know like a broad overview thing. I think it got published as a as a book chapter. At least it looks a bit like a book chapter. I think. Um, and so some of the things we'll be talking about today uh, are a couple of terms, namely facilitation. Um, Potentiation. 
also often abbreviated PTP. Um, and, and so, so just a quick question, are you even define short-term synaptic plasticity versus LTP versus yes. adaptation or yes. something like that? Uh, I guess the main idea is that short-term plasticity is short-term because it's typically associated with a transient thing. So a synapse is not is changed for some amount of time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those amounts of time. Uh, and that's in fact already the big difference between these three processes because there are three processes at different uh, time scales. Right? There are also more lasting forms of synaptic plasticity, like LTP, long-term potentiation, which are very structural changes to the synapse, like new receptors, particularly on the postsynaptic side, there's a lot of lasting changes. Um, but this is not part of this topic. Right? So this is not about re-changing, like changing the network in the long run. This is about short-term changes that after some time that remains specified will disappear. Okay, so the exact time scale we're talking about is mm -hmm. um, unspecified? Uh, well, maybe we can do that as a first thing, right? Um, so we can make a table out of this. Um, so yeah. that the time comes in up here. Hey, Flurry, put those light switches on if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, and so um, maybe we should first um, talk a little about um, how, why we, you know, found this thing and what is weird about um, synaptic transmission that we might even think that some, something like this even exists. Um, so what you find when you are investigating a synapse, right, typically you are stimulating somewhere, so you have like uh, maybe you have an electron in here, or some other way of observing this neuron, right? And then you typically have, you know, on the receiving side, on the post side, you are recording maybe a membrane voltage, or maybe you just have an electrode nearby that picks up the spikes. Um, in the most ideal case, you have something called a patch. Um, electrodes so that something actually breaks into the neurons so you're capable of observing what's happening um, with the potential on the receiving side. Right? And so if you now put a couple of stimuli um, on the on the um, on the presynaptic side, so you make the pre the neuron fire, right? Uh, such that it releases neurotransmitters, such that there will be an effect on the postsynaptic side. You can now observe uh, for every spike that gets elicited. Oh, I should not just plot this table. Should I plot a little bit? Plot the layer of all of this. I can put this somewhere here. A little readout. We can now observe the postsynaptic effect. In the main, there's two ways to, to measure this. There's the postsynaptic potential and postsynaptic current. The idea being that when there's transmitter being released and uh, you know being uptaken there, then there is some change in the postsynaptic potential. So there's some membrane voltage here, and that membrane voltage changes, um, and that changes every time there's a spike transmission because that receptor will open ion channels and biomechanical stuff will happen. Right? Okay, silly question. Mm -hmm. Potential to do what? Ah. Uh, Potential in the in the uh, electrical engineering sense, as in the voltage, the membrane voltage, oh, okay. right? So there's a membrane voltage here. This might be a local voltage, right? This might not affect like the whole neuron yet. Maybe it's just a genetic branch, you know. But this this is essentially what we what we want to track. And um, what you see are these these deflections, right? Um, and um, what I want to talk a little bit about, maybe I can find a nice figure here that shows this a little bit. Uh, yeah, maybe that's good, maybe that's not good. It's like a fraction of the APSP. Mm. Yeah, maybe this is maybe this is nice. So. What, what you typically see when you transmit a spike is you have like some, some fluctuating membrane voltage 
And then when there is a when there was a release of neurotransmitter, then that membrane voltage will change, right? Typically you sort of like uh, invert the axis, so like this is these are all negative numbers, right? And um, so there's some deflection of the membrane voltage and then some decay down. Right? So this decay down is something that's also called the synaptic trace. So this is the deflection that got caused because there was a spike. Here. Right? So this neuron spiked, there was a stimulus at this time, T1, and then maybe you have another stimulus at time T2. And the weird thing that people have observed is that the deflection in the membrane voltage at time T2 is not the same as it was at time T1. In fact, it might be a lot larger. So maybe the second one looks a lot steeper. So, I'm a little confused about where the axes are going. So, are you saying it's depolarized? It's, it's more depolarized now? Um, what is. Yes. Yes. It's so, still positive, it's still up. Uh, yeah, so yeah. maybe imagine this is maybe uh, minus 55 millivolts, and this is maybe minus 54 millivolts. Okay. Right? So, what you, will, what you saw here then is this. This gap here, this is what is called the excitatory post-synaptic potential, EPSP. Maybe we should like, keep a little index of terms also somewhere. Uh, we have this here, right? So we have the excitatory post-synaptic potential, EPSP. Sometimes, because this is general, this can also be inhibitory, right, if you are um, not going towards the firing threshold, but putting the neuron away from the firing threshold, then it might be an IPSP, an inhibitory post-synaptic potential, or just in general terms, this is called post-synaptic potential. It's called post-synaptic because you're measuring the change from the spike condition at the post-synapse. Uh, obviously, the pre synapse there must have been some spike that traveled there that actually you know, then caused transmission. One, one high level comment I wanted to make about mm -hmm. the relationship to machine learning mm -hmm. um, there's nothing like this in machine learning, basically. Other than like Thomas McConey's work and maybe a couple of other things, you know, everything in machine learning is about long term and what changes. Right. And long, you know, what would be equivalent to LTP. Right. And, and we're going to. And this, 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 there's nothing like, like this. Right. right. The fact that shortly after that, the, the weight is increased, so the impact is an right. increase of the exact same signal. Yeah. There's no concept like that. And this is all very short time scales. You know, within, yeah. uh, is this also a rule for spiking neural networks? Or? Uh, spiking neural networks, it depends on what you mean by them. Um, if you look at you normal spiking, at the look, <laughs> you know, Spiking neural networks encompasses a very large scale of models. There are some that are very close to biology, uh, compartmental models, and so on, and those would include this. Yeah. Then there's like the stuff that's very close to machine learning that's yeah. implemented in hardware and stuff like that. They won't have anything like this. Come on, knowledge. This is a very short term change. Right. Um, so, what's the one to do? What's the like second? Is this right? is yeah, this is, these are like some time apart. So maybe we can actually move to the like a figure of the plots, uh, this this figure here, right? So you can see like for uh, the most common uh, neurotransmitter um, uh, the most common receptor, so let's say glutamate and an AMPA receptor, that k time of that exponential is like roughly five six milliseconds. So that's why the width of that pulse is, you know, maybe 40 milliseconds or something. Uh, notice that the spike is, of course, a lot sharper, right? The spike is like a millisecond and then, you know, decaying down very quick. But on the receiving side, the signal is a lot broader because the electrochemical stuff is a bit slower. Right? Um, so on the, on the, maybe I can show this in here, right? So here, this is the, the, the spike. Right, is a very narrow thing. So this is like like a millisecond, right? As opposed to as opposed to this, which maybe you know is like 
nodes 10, 15 milliseconds or something like that. Um, and so this is a particular experiment where you have two spikes at the pre synapse so it depolarizes and around twice with some time delay. And then you measure the change in the EPSP on this side. It's called a pulse pair or like pair pulse facilitation experiment. It's the most simple form of demonstrating short term plasticity at a synapse. Um, so, and then what you're really interested in is not the absolute number here, but you're interested in the relative change. Right? So that's why when people plot this in these figures, where you see um, this, uh, this first excitatory postsynaptic potential here, denoted A, and then the second one is denoted B, then what you're really interested in is the ratio of B to A. And, and so, so in this simulated experiment, so this is like very clean because it's you know, based on a mathematical model, what you see is that, um, that there's, depending on the delta between the two spikes, the further you move them apart, the, slower that, the lower that ratio is. When you have these two spikes in rapid succession, so you're trying to transmit information right, very quickly in succession, then, there, then that potentiation will be quite big. It's like, like a doubling, doubling tripling, tripling, you know, up to, to tenfold increase in some synapses. So suddenly a single synapse is 10 times more efficient just because immediately before it got to transmit something, there was another spike. Yeah. On the left end of this is what we would often refer to as bursting. When I think when the presynaptic neuron might fire multiple spikes within just a couple of milliseconds. Oh, right. Okay. right. Would be like a rapid burst and that can have a huge effect on the Yes. Thing. So once you are talking about more than two spikes, there will also be other effects that will also slow down transmission, like depression, we'll talk about that too. Um, but for now, this figure just shows what happens when you only have two spikes in rapid succession. And what it shows is that somehow the synapse gets a lot more powerful and you see that with a, with a second spike. So something happens after the first spike that makes the synapse a lot stronger. And the closer that it is together, the stronger? And the closer they are together, the stronger that effect. That's what you see in this plot, right? So brief, brief um, pulse pairs, right? short pulse pairs, generate a lot of what is now called facilitation. So facilitation in the sense that like, it facilitates effective synaptic transmission. That's maybe where that term came from. I don't know who exactly coined it. Um, all of these terms have, of course, you know, like an old origin. And so when people analyze the shape of this, uh, what looks like an exponential, they actually found out that the best way to fit it is with a double exponential. So you see this here, right? So this is uh, an equation that very nicely describes this line that goes through all these data points. And when you do a mathematical fit on that, you find, well, there's actually two forms of facilitation, a fast facilitation. So there's one exponential that decays down very quickly, right? Down, down this gradient here, like from here down there. And there's one that is a lot slower, which you see at the tail end, which decays with a time constant is not like 40 milliseconds, but more like 300 milliseconds. So actually, it turns out, because when people coined these terms, they were not very careful. We need to break this out into two categories. There's called F1 facilitation, which is very fast. In this particular synapse, they observed it's 40 milliseconds. It might also be 20 or 10 or 50, you know, don't get stuck to exact numbers, but we are talking clearly less than 100 milliseconds. And there is, in most synapses, also a second type of facilitation, a slower decaying part of that facilitation, which is like a couple hundred milliseconds. In this case, um, 300 milliseconds. So my cortical network models use a fit that got, uh, was done by somebody else who uses, like, we use like 500 milliseconds for a facilitation time constant, which is relatively long, but has been found in cortical synapses. Sorry, when you kept using the word somehow, mm -hmm. so we have no idea how like, physiologically this thing works. Yes, we do, and we're gonna okay. talk a little bit about it. <laughs> um,
I'm, I'm saying somehow because I've not explained to you what is happening biochemically. Uh, right? Now, it turns out when you do transmit a lot of spikes, there's more than just this happening. So there's, in fact, a whole zoo of things. So if you take a look, if you repeatedly transmitted spikes, and so on the y-axis here, you see a relation to sort of the original spike transmission. So if you spike very slowly at about 0 0.5 hertz, you don't see a change in the EPSP. So if you put two seconds between any spikes, this thing will always stay at the same height. So the deflection on a postsynaptic side stays constant in almost all cortical neurons. So there is a speed of stimulation that will not change the synaptic efficacy. Mm. In that case, you will see this number stay at 1. And over a long time, that number will always decay back to 1, unless you have what is called long-term potentiation. But those are special protocols. You need to do certain kinds of potentiation to see that. When we are talking only about short-term synaptic plasticity, there is still more than facilitation that happens, though. There's a good question, actually. These mm -hmm. facilitations are happening in the same synapses, right? Right. Yeah. It's not like there's certain, these synapses are one type and these are different. Right. Yeah. Um, so facilitation is a very common phenomenon. Um, so you, can, you expect it at most synapses, but there are synapses that don't have evident facilitation. And then the question is maybe why? We get to that when we get the mechanical, biomechanical stuff behind it. But it turns out there's also some other component because the total enhancement, even when the facilitation has died down, it turns out that even when, when this effect right, of larger and larger EPSPs, um, even when that has decayed down, it turns out it doesn't go back to one within those 300, 600 milliseconds. It turns out that even a couple of seconds later, there's still some higher EPSP now. So if I check now, um, you know, at a time distance of, let's get some number within the line of these plots, right, like some 10 seconds later, right, that facilitation might be gone, but there's still some residual elevation here, which comes from other processes. So these other processes often get lumped together as PTP, but actually, you can break that apart into augmentation and post-synaptic, uh, uh, post-titanic potentiation. The reason why it's called post-titanic is because it refers to a titanic stimulus. So the idea being you don't just do a brief little pair of pulses, but you do a whole burst of pulses. And when you do that, you see more of these lasting changes, or more lasting because they're still temporary. But they have a different time constant. So when you do the math and you analyze the shapes of this decay of the synaptic efficacy, what you find is that the, there's um, also augmentation, which might go back to baseline at like, I don't know, five to 10 seconds. And there is a, a weaker form of non-lasting uh, non form of synaptic efficacy increase, which might last like maybe a minute. So, so I'm a little confused between the, uh, what these different graphs are showing. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are, the, are these different protocols here? That right, maybe we can actually read the specific... How does it relate to what you're putting down there? Right. So this is a simulated experiment. Because this post-Titanic is completely different. It's like there's a burst of uh, or maybe different protocols. Right. Here's the actual protocol that they used. So at first you have a pulse train of 0 0.5 hertz. That is the one that I told you does not normally change a synapse, right? So that is what you see at the beginning here up to time zero. Right? So this thing here is what's sort of measured really on the, on the postsynaptic side, right? And they, but they break it apart then into different components below. So this is where you are putting a pulse and the EPSP is still the same, so that fraction of EPSP amplitude is one. And you do it again and again and again, and they're interspaced with two seconds. Right? Mm -hmm. So at first, 
you have sort of a slow, slow stimulation of their network and you see that the synapse doesn't really change, right? It transmits some current and that current is pretty much always the same. So their postsynaptic potential is pretty much always the same. Then at time zero, which you see down here, there's a time axis, that changes and instead we are applying a so-called tetanic stimulation. So that means we now have a 10 hertz train for 10 seconds. So a total of 100 spikes at the pre-synapse. Right? So 10 times a second, the, we force the pre-synapse to fire. And we do that for 10 seconds. So total of 100 spikes. If we do that, then we see the following. Over the course of those of those 10 seconds, keep in mind, right, 0 to 10 seconds, right, so this is the stimulation window, right, this is the time during which we stimulate. We see that the postsynaptic potential goes up like seven, almost eight fold. And then when we see stimulating, it drops down, but it doesn't drop down to one. There's some component that lasts. And when you build mathematical models to fit that, you sort of like can sort of take apart different components of this. Turns out you can also interfere with these different components in different ways. So you can actually isolate them with biomechanical machinations. And so then you can sort of separate out the facilitation, which will be gone very quickly, right? We end stimulation here and it goes down very quickly back to, back to, back to one. But there is some component that went up, the post-tetanic potentiation, which actually includes augmentation and post-tetanic potentiation. Again, it's the trouble that these terms were not very neatly defined early on. So people had this term first, and then they found out, well, there's a slower component and a faster component, a little bit like with the facilitation. And so they broke apart this category. So I think of it in terms of three categories, but maybe it's two categories that got broken up into four. Um, and so this thing uh, got high to a multiplicative level of four here, right? And the case somewhat slower. Um, somewhat slower meaning that a minute later, right, it's quite a bit lower, but not quite back to baseline. So that's, it, that's this time constant here, right? And if you analyze the exact shape of that decay, maybe you find out there's a faster decay early on, which is like five to 10 seconds, and then a slightly slower decay back to baseline at uh, one second. So where is augmentation there? It's sort of sub subsumed in the post-tetanic potentiation. So like if you wanted to, you could have like PTP here and then it branches out into what is strictly post-tetanic potentiation and augmentation, which is a bit okay. faster decaying form of post-tetanic potentiation. A little bit like we broke apart the facilitation also into two different forms. So all these things happen pretty much at the same time, like at the same synapse? Exactly. So it, it turns out like in analyzing all this data, people found out that the best way to describe these things that are happening is not as one process, but multiple processes that multiply each other to yield an effective synaptic connectivity. So like multiply with each other or like add with each other? This is multiply, or? not add. Right. So these things, like the total enhancement is the multiplication of the ones below? And again, it depends a little bit on which synapse you're studying, right? But um, they're, they're not just additive. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the argument that is being made. But you could consider this just one complex process and we just, we're just breaking it out to make it mm -hmm. Yes. Does it help to break yes. it down right here? Like what sort of gain in breaking it down? Um, what is being gained is getting an understanding of what is actually happening. Like the mechanisms. The oh, mechanisms right. behind it. It might be there are multiple independent mechanisms. Right. Mm -hmm. sure. And maybe we should talk a little bit about that mechanism now, right? right? Um, so, what do we know about synaptic transmission? Synaptic transmission works by releasing synaptic vesicles, right? Um, so it turns out there's some special little proteins in the membrane that allow vesicles to dock on them. So you have these vesicles, which also have other special proteins that they can use to dock. And these vesicles are filled with an actual neurotransmitter. Uh, this might be like uh, 1,000 or 10,000 molecules of one specific neurotransmitter. So this might be glutamate, 
um, in the sort of most common form of synaptic transmission. Um, and then these vesicles, they can dock with a membrane. So they are at a special point now. And then there's some chemical changes that can happen after that, which makes this vesicle now a releasable vesicle. And how do these vesicles actually get released? Anybody want to propose anything? Calcium. Ah, yeah, there we go. Awesome, good guess, right? So it turns out, so it turns out what, it, what is happening is that inside or very near these docking stations, there are also special... Um, special channels, so special proteins, which are called voltage-gated calcium channels. Voltage-gated calcium channel. And what this thing can do is it can let in calcium, relatively big ions, so that, that's why the two plus, you know, actually ions, it's not metallic calcium, <laughs> uh, that would be pretty dangerous. And when the voltage is changed by a spike, then they can let in calcium. And that calcium, when the calcium concentration goes high, that can trigger what is called exocytosis. So I'm going to draw another release site here to show where the vesicle then fuses with the membrane and then spills out its contents into the synaptic cleft. That is called exocytosis. So the calcium intake causes these vesicles to do this? Yes. How, how do you spell that? Oh my god. Time. <laughs> right, I think it's excitosis. But again, I'm not a biologist. Right. Can search for it. Right. Well, it's we let's just call it release, right? <laughs> Vesicle release. So we can use that term. So I thought vesicles also uh, were sort of floated in between the synapse and the, uh, like sort of in that sort of middle, middle, uh, I don't know how to call that. So the region in between. Do they not sort of exist between cells as well? No, they don't? No. Okay, no. What, what does exist between the cells is, of course, the free, free flowing release transmitter. Okay. And there are mechanisms to put that transmitter back into the cell. Right? That's called transmitter reuptake. Transmitter reuptake. Right, and that is used to fill new vesicles. Right? To refill them. So ions don't get removed from the go don't get released from the presynapse at all? It's just the vesicle. I don't know. Or Say again? What? Or sorry, the sorry, the the presynapse releases transmitters, but right. it doesn't release any like ions of any sort or the term is transmitter. Well there's a lot of stuff that happens. But the point of transmission is that it releases these, you know, it opens these vesicles to the outside by fusing yeah. with the cell membrane. Right? That is the mechanism of, of transmission. Mm -hmm. And so one of the interesting things that people have found is that when you manipulate the calcium content inside the presynapse, you can get facilitation, for example, without ever having stimulated the synapse. So, um, so maybe we should introduce a couple more terms now. Um, so this vesicle opening, that's like a one millisecond? How, does it, how long does it take to open those? Oh, that's, that's quite quick, yes. Yeah, that's a nice picture. Oh, that's a that is a very nice picture. Oh, right. <laughs> and just for my uh, clarity, none of this involves any postsynaptic um, uh, activity, right? This, this is, is all presynaptic. So whether any uh, the postsynaptic cell fired on uh, here, here, there's no uh, cell fire postsynaptic cell firing. Right. right. So these are all the presynaptic mechanisms that go underneath right. that label. But there are, of course, also post. -synaptic 
postsynaptic mechanisms, which I'm not right. talking about. I mean, there's a postsynaptic effect here with the EPSP, but right. there's no back action potential or anything like that no. in any of this no. plasticity. No. Retrograde signaling exists and it has effect on the presynapse, but I'm not I'm talking about it. Yeah. I'm keeping it simple. And so uh, it turns out that um, there's a crucial role for these, for these calcium ions. And there have been all kinds of uh, attempts to, to explain it uh, early on. And then eventually people had this idea since, since it kind of always seems to go with, um, with, uh, with calcium and you don't even need spikes. So it says here like facilitation can even be evoked by constant depolarizing pulses under voltage clamp that activates invariant calcium influx and constant presynaptic calcium change. So if you find a way to change the calcium, you will get, um, you will get a change in how effective a synapse is. Um, uh, Kevin just had a question. He mm -hmm. says, what does tetanic mean outside of motor neurons? Ooh. To, to me, the term tetanic just means, uh, I only know it from stimuli, and it means sort of like a long lasting, crazy burst of activity. It tends to be rather artificial, but it's a nice way of testing a system. Uh, I cannot give a proper definition. Um, I know it only from the term titanic stimulus, right? So maybe we should add that to these terms here. Titanic. It's apparently related to the tonic muscle spasms. So yeah. So that's an example of a titanic stimulus, like 10 hertz, 10 seconds long. You might even do more than that. And, and here, when you're saying facilitation as a result of calcium, are you literally talking about that facilitation or just more generically? Uh, yes, we are literally talking about, about that, it. Turns that out, time scale. Right, yeah. right, right. It turns out when you fiddle with the calcium, you get a quick change. Um, and they then decay also, you know, with, with, with these. That. With these things, um, and so it turns out, that, you know, you can do a lot of analysis on this, and people have been puzzling at how these things work and how to take them apart and in what situations they exist, and uh, you know, and so people have tried things like to elevate the presynaptic calcium, um, in, enhances action potential evoked release, right? Uh, nice term to get around the exocytosis part. So the argument is that if you, for example, fuse some calcium containing liposomes, so you have like these, um, you pack the calcium ions in like a lipid layer and then you fuse that with a, with, a, with a cell and you can increase the calcium intracellularly, then it turns out suddenly the action potentials are more effective. Uh, if you expose um, exposure of calcium ionophores, uh, so it's again another way of transporting calcium or like uh, you poison some mitochondria with calcium so you overload them mitochondria can buffer calcium so that can raise the intracellular calcium or you uh, use iontophoresis so you that means you apply a current and that current will then open these channels even though there is no spike and will allow the calcium to flow in um, or you can use photolysis of presynaptic caged calcium chelators. So what is a chelator? Chelators are like these special molecules often involving a double nitrogen bond, which can hold on to metal ions. Like we use them to detoxify people with like heavy, heavy metal toxins in their blood or something because they can essentially bind to these metals and make them chemically inert. Uh, but you can use that as a mechanism also to transport calcium ions, which are metal ions, into a cell, right? Um, so in all, of these, in all of these cases, right, the action potential induced postsynaptic potential are dramatically increased, whatever dramatically means, but you know, like a factor of, you know, larger than one, maybe something like 10, right? Um, similarly, when you introduce agents that will buffer the calcium, so they are capable of, you know, docking to something and not immediately making the calcium available. So you have special agents here that sort of suck up some of the calcium. Then you see that the, that, that effect of these sudden increases in potentiation 
which last, you know, with different time constants, also goes down. Again, increasing our confidence that somehow the calcium is not just responsible for fusing these vesicles, but it's also responsible for the lasting effect. And then why is this lasting effect? So people have been proposing a theory, and that's called the residuum calcium theory. The argument goes something like this. Every time there's a spike, okay, calcium is used to trigger the fusion of these vesicles. That's fine. But now we've introduced calcium to the presynapse, so when we do that many, many times, like in one of those titanic stimuli, we will actually increase the calcium concentration inside the cell. So now the calcium concentration is higher. And somehow that calcium concentration now leads to a higher likelihood of these vesicles getting released when there is a spike. So we should get clear about some numbers here. So the smallest thing that can happen at a synapse is the release of a single vesicle. That can happen sometimes accidentally, and these are then called MPSPs, miniature postsynaptic potentials. One more turn. Are you writing that I'm going to note that it's 11 o'clock? Right. I'll see that I get to some, some baseline before. <laughs> Um, so that would be if some random vesicle fuses and spills itself out, it's going to release like, a, you know, 100 or 1,000 messenger molecules. Those are going to do something. It won't be this big. It will be much smaller. Right. right? That's why it's called a miniature. Might be something like this. So that's an MPSP. It looks like a fluctuation, but it's actually an accidental release of a vesicle. Those happen with a lot more frequent once you have done something like this. So, you know, telling us that, well, maybe there's something to that, to that theory. A figure I would like to show uh, that kind of gets that across is this beautiful drawing. Let me zoom in on that. How do I zoom in on that? Thing up, up, up on top. Up on top. On the left, left. Left. That's no, add to the left. Oh, there. there. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> no, this doesn't do anything. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, whatever. It's not bad interplay. All right. I can install your operating system. Right. Right. Well, I hope you can see it. Yeah, it's fine for us. So the point is, um, the, the model, as you might understand, it's like there is this local calcium increase when there is a spike. And this spike, this spike in calcium make, releases the vesicles, right? So that's the released pool, right? Those were the vesicles that were actually spilled in the, into the cleft. And this pool is called the immediately releasable pool. The idea being there is a number of these docking sites and when there is an actual spike, you know, maybe some eight vesicles or something get released, right, to add up all these MPSPs into a real EPSP. Um, and so that is sort of a, a small but immediately releasable pool. So as soon as there is any calcium, all of those will, will go. Right? It's like ready to fire. That just means that they're like in, happen to be in a position to, to be ready to go close to... Right. Yeah, they're at the gate. They are at the gate. It turns out there's a couple of things that need to happen. First, the vesicle needs to be made, and the vesicle needs to dock, and then some chemical change needs to make, be made at the docking site that makes it sort of ready to go. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of biochemical investigation that revealed that. Um, and then the idea is that, look, there is something called a readily releasable pool. So these are sort of, you could think of it as quick replacements for these vesicles. And that might have a certain size and would be very interesting to find out what that size is. And then there's also a reserve pool that can get recruited, but that takes a long time. So at a big synapse, there might be a couple of hundred or maybe even a couple of thousand vesicles. Right? That's, a, that's a big synapse. It, so inside a bouton. Right? But that does not mean that a synapse can release a thousand vesicles. Under a titanic stimulus like this, you know, estimates are, you know, a couple of hundred vesicles get released. Again, depending which synapses you're talking about, you know, and brain area and whatsoever. But it's important to understand that these are integer numbers, right? So it's not good to talk about a vesicle concentration. 
because they're you know small enough numbers that you should really be talking about how many. Um, and that's why we really want to understand this process. And the question is, are all of these different processes maybe related to different chemical processes that are calcium dependent inside the synapse that actually are not just part of releasing, but then also maybe the calcium helps with recruiting into the cell, to the, to the re ready really releasable cells, and maybe it helps you know, repower that, um, that um, what is it called, the readily releasable pool. I, and so people have been trying to estimate that. I just read um, some, um, was it yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, there was a Henry Markram paper about trying to find out that number, right? Estimating the readily releasable vesicle pool size at synaptic connections and neocortex. It's an important thing to find out, mm -hmm. right? Because it informs all these models and how they work. And then you do all kinds of interesting experimentations to try to try to get to, to a number, right? So these you can see all these spike trains here, right? So these are all uh, linked to, to these things, and you build mathematical models that try to predict, right, really how does it work, right? I'm just clicking through this to, to, to show you some figures that sort of might remind you a little bit of what I talked about. Um, so this is an ongoing topic of investigation, right? People are like talking about this. Now, what are the actual numbers on this? So it turns out that the original idea of making this just dependent on calcium turns out to be a little bit problematic. When you actually measure the relationship between the postsynaptic current and the calcium concentration, there's, uh, it roughly goes with the fourth power of the calcium concentration. And if you then argue that, look, the local increase, so there's some baseline calcium, which is very, very low, at on the order of uh, 0.1 micromolar calcium. So that is what we call the, 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 the at rest. So let's call it calcium, calcium rest. Calcium at rest. And then we know that right close to release site, this spikes up to something like 21. micromolar it's kind of what you what you get in there and then there's sort of um, 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 the residual ones so when you do multiple of these because these of course is very local so that diffuses out over the course of like some 20 30 milliseconds a little bit similar to this time constant interestingly enough and then you might have a concentration at this button here which might be like one micromolar so that's the calcium uh, let's call it the residual calcium, the one that remains after a lot of spikes and all of the diffusion out. And this is a very local concentration. So this is the kind of concentration that you need to release vesicles. This is the kind of concentration you might get after a lot of spikes. And this is the kind of concentration that is normal when the neuron is not active. So you can see that these are really quite different, right? It's a very high number, and it turns out that when you do the math on this, uh, it doesn't quite properly work. So, because um, if you if you actually build the ratio of this uh, with and without that increase in the residual calcium, so you do the what is it? Twenty plus one plus zero point one to the power of four, and you divide that by the twenty plus zero, so assuming that the residual calcium is not increased, plus the resting concentration 0 0.1 to the power of four, that is just an increase of 20%. But what we are seeing here is a doubling, tripling, quadrupling of the synaptic efficacy. So it turns out this idea that it's really just one local process cannot explain how powerful facilitation is. This slight little increase by to one micromolar, that's actually capital M, cannot explain how powerful facilitation is. So in fact, there needs to be chemical stuff happening here, there needs to be chemical stuff happening at all these different transitions. And people 
And nowadays building very intricate models, oh, but now that's not what I wanted. I wanted this, a general model of synaptic transmission and short-term plasticity. And then they built figures like this. So what you see here, can I zoom in on that? Yes, here I can zoom, how nice. So this is a model of what might be happening. You see lots of you know, chemical transitions here with uh, balances of forward and backward reactions. And calcium always seems to play a role. And in order to properly explain things, people build these models of an active zone where they try to simulate a tiny little piece of the, of the membrane, right? And to see what is happening there. And then they have these big models here with all these chemical transmission that somehow go from the priming of these two uh, proteins. So this is like a V complex and this is like a W complex, just to explain where those come from. Um, somehow go to exo exocytosis, there you see the word, right? That's what it should be. Um, and so then you build mathematical models that turn out like these are a lot better now at describing what is actually happening and you hopefully learn from that, right? And the parameters that are needed to fit these models, oh, there you get actually some very nice thing. So here you get some numbers, right? Some 12,000 vesicles in all the three pools makes it gives you like some 12,000, right? Even though the readily releasable pool is much smaller, right? You release like some, maybe some 10 vesicles or something on a spike. In a futon, and just the presynaptic side. Right? Just the presynaptic. We are only talking about presynaptic mechanisms here, right? So uh, the, the reason why I'm talking about it all is to, just to make you understand that it's a lot of biomechanical machinery that is happening here in order to prime these things for release, to, to make them re-releasable once the immediately releasable ones have been re-released, so the readily releasable pool. And then there's a big reserve pool, and it turns out that calcium plays a role in these interactions of all of them. And you need quite complicated biomechanical models, there's a lot of different proteins involved, but somehow calcium always plays a role. Which is why calcium, when you meddle with calcium, you can make a synapse, you know, behave rather differently. Um, you can even, you know, block all transmission. If you find a way of like calcium, taking the calcium out completely, out of the extracellular fluid, calcium can't flow in, meaning the synapse can never release anything. They get stuck, right? Um, sort of proving that you really need these molecules. They're really at the core of this. There's not hypothesizing this, you know, these, these models are getting pretty good in explaining this. Um, and so the reason why I think so modelers like, like Numenta need to know about this is because these effects are pretty large. Because a synapse can suddenly be five or six times as effective, but only for some short time. And so it might matter for something that takes pro time, you know, on this order, um, like a simple inference task. It might matter that um, these, uh, the, the synaptic efficacy, you know, can, can flip up and down like that. Um, and so that is the main reason why I wanted to introduce you to this and give you like a little glimpse into it. Obviously, once you boil down into detail, it gets very biomechanical. Um, and yeah, if you're curious about it, we can talk about it all day long. But I guess that's kind of how, what the functional impact of this is uh, from the level of the thousand yes. brain theory and other right. stuff that we're right. doing. I guess that's, we're going to talk about that next week when Jeff yeah. is here. But I can see why you think there might be right. uh, you know, impact on how we do unions or uh, mm -hmm. build out hypotheses. And, I will, I will get very explicit yeah. about that. I yeah. have much more concrete ideas. Um, one thing that is important for us, obviously, we don't want to simulate all of this detail, right? We wouldn't care about all the, you know, simulating individual calcium ions. Um, but we might want to care to have build a reduced model of all of this complexity. And so it turns out there are some people who care a lot for computational neuroscience who built Biomechanic, biomechanical models that reduce this down to like two, three differential equations that work well together and actually describe most of this reasonably well. And so those kinds of reduced models I'll be talking a little bit about in coming talks and how one can use them 
to do very interesting kinds of computations in, uh, in, in neural networks in the short term. All of this is short term dynamics, right? None of these things change the network in the long run. Um, are, are, in your line of uh, talking on the subject, are you going to talk about oscillations or topology at all? Or is that totally unrelated? So oscillations play a role because, of course, gamma bursts, like fast oscillations, um, have very short time intervals between these, right? Let's say like a typical gamma burst, maybe some 70, 80 hertz. That means there's a time difference of, you know, some, well, 15 milliseconds, frankly, right? So there will be a lot of facilitation, but it will also decay down because these bursts are just 100 milliseconds long. They're way shorter than these. So if you want to properly describe synaptic transmission of a gamma burst, there's no way you can do it without you know, uh, accounting for this massive boosting that happens on the second, third, fourth spike. Oh, okay. um, and so you need a simpler model than the full biomechanical stuff, because it's way too expensive to simulate. Um, but you need to have some description of of it, or else you will not adequately capture, right, in a in a in a model that has membrane voltages, what happens. That's I mean, why I care. You mentioned that this titanic stimulation is somewhat artificial and convenient. Does yeah. that happen in 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 vivo? Do do people notice anything? Why use this kind of stimulation? Ah. Uh, because it's a simple paradigm. But, but uh, my, my issue is, okay, so if you do I, this, then you get these augmentation and PTP effects mm -hmm. and stuff, but if that never happens in vivo, do we really care about the bottom half of this? Right, um, right. Um, I personally think we shouldn't. I think what we should be looking at, and it's obviously a debate to have with, um, to have with, um, with biologists, should be gamma bursts. Uh, if you look at, let's say, prefrontal cortex, these ten, these, these are more like 70 hertz, a bit faster, and more like 0 0.1 seconds, like 100 milliseconds long. Brief, very high power bursts. You still get a lot of spikes. These are brief packages, right? They're linked to info active information processing in a lot of different brain areas. And that's what I think they should be doing. Uh, there are some experimentalists who started using these, and the thalamus generates stuff like that too. Right. Um, this kind of brief burst impulse. Right. Yeah. The, the, the argument is if you have this biomechanical machinery to make the second, third, and fourth spike very big compared to the first, yeah. you gain two things. You gain robustness because a single spike is not going to do a lot. I mean, it's going to release one EPSP. So if you have an accidental transmission, that won't happen. It makes it robust against noise. But then when you do have enough uh, to go beyond the, your robustness threshold, when you're actually transmitting two, three spikes, then they become suddenly super powerful, mm -hmm. meaning you get a lot of signal to noise ratio. So in that sense, this idea of sending, let's say, six spikes, right, and having the first two make the sign up super powerful so that the latter ones will then do a lot of transmission for a very clear signal, right, makes a lot of sense, like biomechanically. Uh, and I think there's not enough attention being paid to it, but there are experimentalists who are using um, what are called uh, theta burst stimuli, TBS. The idea being that uh, theta oscillations are something like 10 hertz, uh, meaning that is roughly a theta length of a stimulus, and then there's a burst nested inside the theta oscillation. Um, I will talk about that in the context of a different paper that actually also looks at the postsynaptic side. There's uh, also something called mini bursts that we've talked about a lot mm -hmm. here, which somehow relates to all of this. But those are, I think, two to four spikes in right. very rapid succession, right. uh, just a couple of milliseconds apart. Yeah, um, and that has a very big downstream impact right. as well. And there's a lot of neurons that in fact specialize on those that kind of transmission. Well, almost all uh, pyramidal cells, but right. particularly layer five cells. Right. Uh, so this becomes very interesting to talk about. I just want to raise a lot of awareness for these short-term effects and that they are important to understand synaptic transmission and that there's different time scales and that they can be separated, that there is biomechanical machinery behind all of this uh, and that it's all a lot more complicated than sort of a simple diagram can show.
That was the, the main point, <laughs> right? Um, well, you've done a great job explaining it in a simple way. Right. As simple as can be. Well, thing, so. yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah, that's what we do. Thanks, Warren. Um, are we stopping the stream now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay.